Good evening and welcome to Abide in the Word for January 16th. Once again, I apologize for not being able to be alive today. Uh, as I said before, I've gotten this idea of how to do this after I had already committed to some evening services. But our first one for the month of February, we will, will be able to do live and I look forward to hopefully having some live interaction with you. What we're going to be doing today is similar to what we did last time with a few few things different. Uh, we're going to start out like we did last time, reading from Psalm 119, and then a prayer modeled after Psalm 119, the second section of Psalm 119. And then we're going to be looking at some stuff that we've that I've had success with in our repeated readings so far, and then share a little bit about differences of Bible translations, then looking at part of Titus for a while. And then we'll be reading Belgic Confession, Article 1, and closing with prayer. So that is what is on the docket. So we begin this evening with looking at the second portion of Psalm 119. As I mentioned two weeks ago, Psalm 119 is broken up into eight verse sections, and each section is or has a heading based upon the Hebrew alphabet. So last week was Aleph, and today is Bet. So we will be reading from Psalm 119, verses 9 through 16, to start this evening. How can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word. With my whole heart I seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments. I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. With my lips I declare all the rules of your mouth. In the way of your testimonies, I delight, as much as in all riches. I will meditate on your precepts and fix my eyes on your ways. I will delight in your statutes. I will not forget your word. Let's pray. Gracious God, we pray that you would strengthen us to keep our way pure. We know that the only way that we can do this is by doing it according to your word. And so we ask that you would give us a desire for your word and that your Holy Spirit would give us wisdom to understand, that we might seek you with our whole heart and not wander from your commandments. Grant that we might store up your word in our heart and that it might give us strength that we might not sin against you. For we know your word teaches us your statutes. May those rules be on our lips as we go about our lives this week. And may we delight in your testimonies, that we might meditate on your precepts and fix our eyes on your ways so that we will delight in your statutes and not forget your holy word. Through Christ our Lord we pray. Amen. Okay, so I want to start out with sharing some of my thoughts on our repeated reading of Titus. Nothing about the text yet, but just the, the process of repeated reading. I think the more we talk about this and interact with this, I mean, obviously this isn't live, so you can't interact with me, but the more we interact about it going forward, the more we can learn from each other on how we are doing. So one of the first things that I have been doing, I have been writing it out. You can see my chicken scratches there. Doesn't look very good, but it has been helpful. It causes me to slow down. It causes me to ponder over each one of the words. And if you're not writing uh, the book out, I really would encourage you to give it a try. Titus is short. Uh, you can do it this month, and if it isn't something that's beneficial for you, uh, you can forget about it for February when we move on to another book. But I really recommend you give that a try. Every time I do it, I am reminded of how beneficial it is, and, and I think, you know, I should have been doing this with something all along. It's, it's a really good practice that really helps you absorb the text better. The other thing that I have done is I have listened to it, and I mentioned that on the uh, Monday or the Tuesday podcast, I think last week, I listened to, to Titus with the ESV app. And I think the person that was reading was Kristen Getty and she has an Irish accent. And that was really, really helpful for me because she put accents on different syllables than I would. She said, says words different ways with her Irish accent. And so I found it to be really valuable. I heard things and actually came back and, and wrote down some of my thoughts uh, I was actually walking around the church to stretch my legs a little bit when I was listening to it, and I immediately came back here and, and got a pen and wrote some stuff down uh, that I noticed because of that. I don't want to dwell on what it was that I noticed. I want you to have that yourself. 
But I just wanted to encourage you to give some of this stuff a try because even though it might seem a little bit different uh, to do it, you've never done it before, it is beneficial to help you hear the text and to understand the text in a different way. And so another tip that I want to give out as we start to um, get a little bit deeper into the process of repeated reading is I want us to take a look at something in my Bible software here that that is helpful. Now, if you were ever interested, if you see me using this Bible software and you say, you know, I think I could use something like that, uh, our membership to Faith Life includes a basic software license for Logos Bible soft software, which is what this is. Uh, you get a decent amount of books and a few different Bible translations and some different tools for studying the Bible. If you are interested in that, fire me an email at pastor at edgertonfrc.org, and I will help you get hooked up. I'll even be more than willing, especially if there are multiple people who are interested, I'll be more than happy to give you a training session on some basic uses of the software. But anyway, this is a text comparison tool. And so you can see here, I have the English Standard Version on the left, far left-hand column, and then the NIV. Now, this is not the 1984 NIV that most of us know. This is actually the newer 2011 NIV. Uh, you cannot get the 1984 NIV in most Bible software. Zondervan wiped it off the face of the planet. You can't buy it in print. You can't buy it digitally. Uh, so this is the 2011 NIV uh, translation. Then I have the new Revised Standard Version, the Geneva Bible, which is really hard to read uh, in the way they did it here. They didn't update the spellings of some of the words. You may be able to see here, this is a lot smaller uh, than I thought it would be. I'm gonna see if I can make it bigger. There we go. Um, you can see as we look at some of these verses here, get back to verse 11. Uh, you can see when they did the Geneva Bible, it says that bringeth salvation, right? There's a C in there. They didn't update the spelling to our modern spelling. Now, there are versions of the Geneva Bible that will do that. Uh, I have one in print uh, that, that spells things the way we're familiar with. Uh, but So that looks a little bit different. Uh, then I have the King James Version, and then the Christian Standard Bible, which is a relatively new translation, and then a very new translation, the New American Standard Bible update, and that was updated, as you can see here, in 2020. So, really, the best thing that we can look at is we look at different Bible translations. And one of the benefits that we have in reading from multiple translations as we do this repeated reading is where words are different. So the big one that I want to draw out for us is between the ESV and the 2011 NIV. Verse 11 of Titus 2 says, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. Notice that language right there. Bringing salvation. Now look at what the NIV does. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. Now, means the same thing, but at the same time, it doesn't exactly mean the same thing, does it? There is some interpretation that is happening there. And that is, that is why it is valuable to read from different translations, because the nature of translation is, is, is that it's difficult. It is hard to not do some sort of interpretation when you translate. And so you can see here that, that this is occurring. The idea of an offer of salvation as opposed to bringing it. One is sounds a little bit more sure. The other one makes it sound like it's more up to the person who the salvation is being offered to to make a decision, right? So there's some in, interpretive uh, stuff going on in the text. But you'll also notice as we come across here, um, the NRSV says bringing salvation. Uh, the Geneva says, bringeth salvation, right? Uh, then the KJV, bringeth salvation. The Christian Standard, bringing salvation. The NASB, bringing salvation. So you have to think a little bit, why did they put that there? What, what is different? But it gives you the opportunity to say, why would they say it that way? What, what benefit would that be? What, what interpretive um, aspect are, are they bringing to that text? And so... There you see one difference in translation. There's another one in here that uh, that I really find interesting. So in verse 14, it says, Who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself 
a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. Well, then the 2011 NIV says, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness instead of lawlessness and purify for himself a people that are his very own, as opposed to a people for his own possession, eager to do what is good. Says basically the same thing, right? It's just different language. Now, I am not going to lie. I love that language, a people for his own possession. That I just, it just seems to me there's something very strong about that. The idea that God has made us a people for himself, a people for his own possession. He is laying hold of us, right? I, I love that language. You probably noticed me using that language, whether in a sermon or in prayers. Uh, I thoroughly enjoy that. But again, it says the same thing in the 2011 NIV, but it, it's different. Tweaks your brain a little bit there, right? When you come across it, especially if it's a phrase that you that you like, you're going to notice some, some differences there, right? You're going to notice, hey, wait a minute, that phrase that I like is, is different here. Let, let's take a look at what that passage means. But again, we come back and we see that there's different, inter, or different uh, translations of this. Here, we have purify for himself a people of his own. Okay, again, says the same thing, but the change in the, the wording is a little bit different. Um, this one from the Geneva and from the and the KJV, I, I like this one. Uh, I like this one a lot. And purge us to be a peculiar people unto himself. Now, I'm guessing the word peculiar means something different in the 16th century and the 17th century than it does now. Uh, peculiar, yeah, we know what peculiar means. It means strange. I think it's um, a set apart, a different people, and not different in the way that we use the word peculiar. Um, but I, I like that. A, a peculiar people of his own, or people unto himself. Uh, you, you, you have to sort of like that language. Then we have here in the CSB, cleanse for himself a people for his own possession. That one is the same as the ESV. And it is the same uh, in the New, New American Standard. Now, I don't want to dwell too much longer on Bible translations as we as we look at this passage that we're going to look at later, but you can sort of see there's two different schools of thought when it comes to Bible translations. You, you probably have, if you've been to some Bible studies with me, I, I bring this up a lot, but there is a trying to be as word for word as possible school of translation, and then more of a thought for thought uh, school of translation. Now, you can't really avoid the thought for thought. All translations are going to try, have to do that in some respect because you cannot just take a word from another language and inject it into the same spot in a sentence. You you have to move things around. You have you have to make it make sense uh, in in our language. Uh, that that's a difficult thing to do. But but a, a translation like the ESV and like the New American Standard and the Christian Standard Bible, they try to mix as little of the thought for thought in and be as close to word for word as possible. They're trying to be as close as possible to the original text. Whereas something like the NIV, um, the NRSV a little bit, but but more so probably the, the one you're probably most familiar with that is a significantly thought for thought translation is the New Living Translation. Uh, that There's hardly anything that, that sounds like these other translations in that. Maybe next time I'll add that to my text comparison here. But those thought for thought translations, they are um, they're trying to help you to understand it. But the difficulty there, and, and I'm not saying that that a thought for thought translation is a bad thing by any stretch of the imagination. But the difference is that the 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 interpretive lens that the translators come to the text with is going to come through more so than in a more of a word for word translation. And so if you really want to get into what the text says as best as you can without learning New Testament Greek or Hebrew, uh, a word-for-word -word translation that does a good job of putting the sentences together so that we can understand them is, is really the best way to go, in my opinion. Again, a translation that you can read, that you enjoy, is always a good one. But I think you can understand why something like the ESV or the CSB, the New American Standard, trying to go with word-for-word -word lets you, as the reader make more of the decisions instead of having the translation precon preconceptions of the translators come through in the text. So I hope you learned a little something about Bible translation there. Uh, hopefully you saw some things about the text and looking at these different ones. Uh,
but I would really encourage you find which use this to find which translation you really like, which one is, is familiar to you. Read that one about 75% of the time and then interject some of these other translations so you can run across some of these word differences and, and stop for a minute and try to understand why were the words different there and does it change the meaning from from what we have and and does this maybe help me understand this a little bit better so hopefully like i said uh, this is a helpful exercise to look at some of these different translations we'll do it again uh, next month and I'll, like i said i'll try to remember to put the nlt on my little list at the top of of different ones there but with that said after some tips and looking at some and giving some advice about bible translations we're going to move on to looking at a portion of titus one thing that I am really appreciating about my repeated reading of Titus is these different sections that are just loaded. They're, they're like an energy drink of scripture, right? Um, you get to these different parts of it and there's just so much at it. It just jumps off the page at you and then you stop and you slow down and you see uh, the story that's unfolding through it and, and how Paul is describing the faith. And Specifically, one of the P, the sections of verses that really jumps out at me the most here is Titus 2, 11 through 14. I have it highlighted, and you can see it. I'm going to read it here, and then we'll work through it uh, slowly together. So, verse 11. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright and godly lives in this in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. Now, this is an absolutely great passage, or I, or I wouldn't have picked it. All of Scripture is great, right? Uh, some of it is just more loaded. And you can't deny the fact that this passage is just loaded with good stuff. So the first thing that we see here, for the grace of God has appeared. So what's the idea that Paul is driving home here? The idea that there's this grace of God that is now something new for them to see. And, and remember, the idea that Jesus has come and is spreading salvation to more than just the Hebrew people is a big, big part of that. We've been seeing that in the book of Luke. Luke has been drawing that out. And then if you're also doing dwell in the word with us on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, this isn't a commercial. It's just, just a fact. I guess it could be a commercial. But if you're doing dwell in the word with us and you're going through Acts, you see the unfolding in the book of Acts of this story of the gospel going to the Gentiles. And we see that here, that this grace of God has appeared we see that it's going to the Gentiles because what does it say? Bringing salvation for all people. Paul isn't meaning here that every person ever is now going to be saved. That is not what it means when he says bringing salvation for all people. What it means is, is that all people groups, salvation is no longer just something for the Hebrew folk, it's no longer just for the Israelites and the Jews, salvation for all people groups. It's come to the Gentiles, those who are once outsiders are now insiders. They are, can be on the inside because of the grace of God. This is the story that is unfolding. This is the story that Paul is telling on his missionary journeys. This is the story that Titus is to proclaim. This is the story that will build the church in the first century, in the second century, all the way up to now. And beyond us, should Christ tarry, this is the message that is going to build the church. It isn't our ability to make it seem appealing. It isn't um, us twisting anybody's arm. That doesn't make the church grow. It doesn't make uh, the kingdom of God expand. It is the grace of God. It's the proclamation of his gospel. This salvation for all people is about God doing this work among all people groups, every tribe, tongue, and nation. That's the language in the book of Revelation, but that's the idea here. So what does this grace do? Verse 12, it trains us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions. Now, we have to go back. Uh, we're talking about the grace of God. We're not talking about the law. Remember that. That isn't what is training us. It, Paul is saying that the grace that we have seen in Christ is showing us how to live. Why? 
Because we have been saved from our sin and unbelief. And so now, if if we understand that we've been saved from our sin, we are going to want to renounce the ungodliness and the worldly passions that caused us to be in sin. And so the grace of God motivates us to live a holy life. And as you always hear me say, this is hard. It is it is so difficult for us to live a life that is contrary to what the world uh, sees as as good. You know, to think that the that ungodliness and worldly passions are, are the way to go. That's that's the way of the world. But we're called to do something different. God has called us by His grace to live godly lives. And so, what does that look like? What does Paul say? It says that we live self controlled upright and godly lives in the present age. That includes that includes us. The present age uh, makes it sound like, oh, good. We don't have to do that in the 21st century. Paul was just talking about the first century. No, the present age is now this, this world that we live in, this world that even though the grace of God has appeared, sin still has its hold on us and on people. But we have been set free in Christ, and so we are called to live self-controlled, upright lives. And as you've heard me say so many times, holiness is really hard because when we do something a little bit better than the world, how do we feel about ourselves? We feel really good. But we're not to be judged against the standard of the world. We're to be judged against the standard of God's law. Uh, We look to what he has called us to, and that's going to look completely different than the world. We can feel really good about our ability to not sin in the same way as the world, but that isn't God's standard. Uh, so when we live in this godly or this ungodly age, if we're going to live a godly life, we have to be focusing on what God has called us to do. But once again, we start with the grace of God. We start with what we've been saved from. And the idea that I always uh, put out there is that if I've been saved by my grace or by God's grace, how Do I want to live in response to that? Do I want to continue sinning? No, I I do. I fail all the time. But I'm going to want to desire to conform my life to his law because I understand that he has saved me from this and that this is the best way for me to live because it is God's design. He is able to know more about the way life works than I could ever imagine. Even though I think I'm infinitely smart on how life should be lived, I'm a fool. I'm a fool. God is wise. And so we want to return to what he has for us. And so as we live these godly lives, what are we doing? We're waiting for our blessed hope. We're waiting for a hope. We don't just live a godly life and say, well, at the end, I'll have lived a better life. And if I'm just in the ground and I have no hope beyond this, at least I lived a better life. No, Paul Paul has no time for that. You can see that in 1 Corinthians 15. He says that if uh, that if we have only hope in this life, then we're of all people to be pitied. And so what is Paul pointing us to? That blessed hope. And what is that? The appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. That at the end of history, he will return to deliver his kingdom to his Father, and we will have resurrected bodies. We will have eternal life. We live this godly life. We desire to please God because he has saved us by his grace and we're hoping for this amazing salvation that has come to us. We're not being saved from a bad way to live. We're being saved from sin, death, and hell. That is an important category for us to remember. Uh, Christianity is not simply good advice. It's good news. And the good news is the grace of God has appeared. And so we're hoping for this return of Christ, the resurrection of our bodies, eternal life with him. And so who is this God and Savior, Jesus Christ? We see in verse 14, and as I said earlier when we're looking at the Bible translations, I absolutely love verse 14, who gave himself for us, okay? So he offered himself for us. It wasn't us, you know, throwing Jesus in in the way of God's wrath saying, hey, you can save us. No, he willingly stepped in the path of God's wrath for us. He gave himself for us. Why? To redeem us. What, what does that word redeem mean? It's, it's slavery language. The idea is, is that we are being bought back from our slavery 
slavery to sin. And so what does he redeem us from? All lawlessness. He redeems us from, from our desire to, to sin. He, re, he re, redeems us from the hold that sin has on us. And then what do we see? That he wants to purify for himself a people for his own possession. How awesome is that? I know I keep on saying that, but just he's purifying us so that we can be his people. And notice, we go back up to verse 11 to bring salvation for all people. Previously, salvation was thought to come only to the Hebrew people, to the Jewish people, to the Israelites. That was who were the people of God. The, the Israelites were the people for God's own possession. And it was an ethnic thing, right? And God chose them. Uh, he used them to bring about the Messiah. They were the cradle with which uh, that Christ was carried through history. The, the bloodline to the Messiah came. But now, we're not the people of God because of ethnicity. We're the people of God because we're saved by grace through faith. So he makes us a people for himself. We are the people of God because he has saved us and he has taken hold of us. We are the people of a people for his own possession. He takes hold of us because of his grace, not because of our ethnicity. We are his people. And it's important, I think, that we see ourselves as the people of God because when we do that, we, we have a bit of a tie with people who have something in common with us, right? Uh, you can run into somebody who's maybe of the same ethnic heritage view, and you say, hey, you're, you're German, or you're Dutch, or you're Irish like I am. And, and you sort of feel a, a commonality, right? Uh, we should be seeing that with all believers, that, ah, you're a believer. We all have been saved by by Christ's grace. So we're brothers and sisters. We have more in common with each other because of that grace, because we have a common father and a common savior than we do with even our neighbor or people in our own family. We are so close because we are the people of God together. So what do we know about these people for God's own possession? Well, they're zealous for good works. They want to serve others because God has first saved them. Now, I mentioned this two weeks ago. As Reformed Christians, we have the best categories, in my opinion. We have the best categories for understanding all of this. We have that Heidelberg Catechism designation, and we also see it in our worship that they, they mirror each other. We understand our guilt before God. That's the first part of the Heidelberg Catechism, our, our guilt before God. We understand that we are sinners. Then we have the section on grace. We understand that God has saved us from our sin and made us a people for his own possession. And then we respond in gratitude. And as I said, this mirrors our worship, right? We, we sing a song of praise. And in that, the idea is, is that we're going to acknowledge the holiness of God and the majesty of God and realize that we ain't him. And we don't have holiness on our own. And so we confess our sins because we understand that we go into his presence needing his grace and his forgiveness. And then what do we do? We hear the word. And the word proclaims the gospel to us. We hear that Christ has suffered and died to save us from our sin. And then what do we do? We respond in praise and with offerings and with confessing our faith. All those things flow together because we, we live our lives in such a way that we understand the grace of God and it leads us to service in God's world. That is what we see here. We are to be zealous for good works. So may we think these things through. May we understand this salvation. And may we have the opportunity to do good works this week because they are going to be there for us. I promise. There's always an opportunity. Uh, a good work is not just going on a mission trip. It's loving your neighbor every day, doing what God has called us to do. So may we see those things and may the grace of God motivate us to do those things in the coming week. Now, before we move on to our closing prayer, I am going to pull up here. We're going to read from Belgic Confession, Article 1. I wanted to look at this uh, last time, but I spaced it off. Uh, I want to kind of have this be the section after we do our Bible study where we, we look at one of the historic creeds. I think we'll work through the Belgic Confession first, which you probably already know this about me. I love the Heidelberg Catechism, the Belgian Confession. These are my two favorites. Uh, maybe at some point we'll move to maybe the Second Helvetic Confession or the Westminster Standards, uh, some Reformed Confessions. Uh, but here we're going to look at an article from the Belgian Confession 
uh, Article One, the only God, as we as we start to finish up today. So, Article One, the only God. We all believe in our hearts and confess with our mouths that there is a single and simple spiritual being whom we call God, eternal, incomprehensible, invisible, unchangeable, infinite, almighty, completely wise, just and good, and the overflowing source of all good. Now, I want to make some quick comment. I might not always uh, make commentary as we look at these confessions, but there is something that's a little bit uh, confusing for us because when we read this, we say there's a single and simple spiritual being. You probably look at that and go, God ain't simple. Uh, I read my Bible all the time and I, under I learn new things about God all the time. He is amazing. How can you call him simple? Well, the idea of simple is that he is not like a pagan God that is that is um, maybe spread out in all these different, and he's found in uh, the tree or found in the moon or whatever. No, God is a simple being, meaning that he is he is three in one. He is together, but he is not this complex thing that we have no concept of in our minds. Uh, we, we can't comprehend God fully. But what I mean by that is, is that he is not like, like the pagan deities that are uh, that we, we sort of come up with on our own. No, he, he is easy to comprehend in his being, not how he exists or everything about him but that he is a simple being. He is, he is one. He is three in one, but he is God. And so as we look at this, we see these, this word simple. And then immediately afterwards comes eternal, incomprehensible, right? Uh, our use of the word simple would be uh, not, very, not very bright, but then we get down and we see eternal, incomprehensible, invisible, unchangeable, infinite, almighty, completely wise. And so that's how we can know that the word simple here in the Belgian Confession uh, doesn't mean uh, not very smart or however you and I would view the word simple. But what a beautiful statement about who God is, that this is where we start, uh, that we believe in our hearts and confess with our mouths that this is who God is. And so as we think about this, this, this eternal, incomprehensible, invisible, unchangeable, infinite, almighty, completely wise, just and good God, uh, we are brought to worship. So may we think about this article and and be able to better understand uh, who God is by looking at his word this week. All right, let's close with prayer. Gracious, almighty, and eternal Lord, we praise you for your truth. It is everlasting and your mercy endures forever. Jesus prayed to you as a son to his father and taught us to pray to you as our father. And so we come to you confident that in your love, you hear our prayers. O God, our Father, we bless you for the gift of your church, for the witness that she has passed on, for the teaching of the law, and for the proclamation of your gospel. Grant to your church today a true understanding of your word, that your people might be nourished by the faithful teaching of Holy Scripture. And we especially remember the ministry of our own congregation this evening. We pray that you would bless our Sunday school and catechism classes. We thank you for the work of our teachers and ask that you would guide them with your wisdom and your strength. We also lift up our covenant children to you. We pray that you would build them up in faith and we ask that you would strengthen us to be faithful to the baptismal promises that we have made to them. And we thank you for how your church has been guided through the ages, from the prophets and the apostles to the teachers, pastors, and evangelists in every age. We pray for those who lead your church now and ask that through their leadership, the church in our day will be found faithful by those who come after us. Sovereign Lord, we bless you for all the people of the earth, for people who believe and for people who doubt, for people who find faith natural and easy, and for those who find it to be a struggle, for those who seem to know the truth simply, and for those who fight against it. Grant to all of us perseverance that we might press on in faith to the glory of Jesus Christ. And we thank you, O Lord, for our nation, for its vastness, for its prosperity, and our freedoms. Grant us wisdom to use our wealth, purity in the use of our freedoms, justice in use of our prosperity, and discipline in our vitality. And we pray for the parents of our congregation. We pray that you would strengthen the mothers and fathers to be faithful in nurturing their children in the faith and raising their children to be righteous. All of these prayers we submit to you 
in the name of our great high priest, Jesus, who we trust is interceding for us right now in this very moment before the throne of grace. Amen. All right, that ends Abide in the Word for this week. I would encourage you to do something. I should have done it at the beginning, but I would encourage you to share in the comments here below. Share successes that you're having, ideas that you have on how to do repeated reading well, things that you're learning in the process. That would be awesome and a great spot for me to see what you're learning. Or you can send me an email. I have mentioned my email address already. It's pastor at edgertonfrc.org. But if you want to just talk to me in person when you see me, that is good as well. More than happy to chat, especially to chat about the book of Titus or anything in scripture. Track me down. Uh, we'll chat about the Bible. I hope you have a great week. Before we go, I'm going to give you a very quick benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen. Have a fantastic week. Take care.